Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, and essays and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Major Jackson and Genevieve Sly Crane or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts readings by and conversations with Gail Mazur, Lloyd Schwartz, and Nicole Therese Dutton. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. So for those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you have already discovered the chat to the right of the page. Please feel free to comment throughout the evening. But if you have a question, I'm gonna to go to the link at the bottom of the page that says, ask a question. So type your question in there. Also at the bottom of your screen is a green link to this episode on Bird's Books website, where you can purchase the author's books while supporting the bookstore in Write America. Our first speaker is Nicole Therese Dutton. Nicole Therese Dutton's work has appeared in Callaloo, Plowshares, 32 Poems, Indiana Review, and Salt Hill Journal. Nicole earned an MFA from Brown University and has received fellowships from the Frost Place, the Fine Arts Work Center, Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her collection of poems, If One of Us Should Fall, was selected of the, as the winner of the 2011 Kawe Kanem Poetry Prize. She teaches in the Solstice Low Residency MFA program and is the editor of the Kenyan Review. Please welcome to the screen. Nicole Therese Dutton, and I know you're here somewhere. There you are. Thank you so much, Alice. It's so wonderful to be here, and thank you, Roger and Lindsay, um, for inviting me and, um, and for all the folks at Birds Books and Write America for making this possible. It's a wonderful opportunity, and, um, and I'm so excited to, to be here to be reading with Gail and Lloyd, who are, who are from my, my, at one point, hometown, my longtime hometown. Um, and from whom I learned a great deal. Um, I'm gonna start by reading a poem called Magnitude and Bond. More than anything, I need this boy so close to my ears, his questions electric as honeybees in an acreage of goldenrod and time where we are slow sugar in the veins of white pine, rubbery mushrooms cloistered at their feet his tawny listening at the water's edge while we consider fox prints etched in clay. I need little black boys to be able to be little black boys. Whole saltwater galaxies and cotton and loudness not fixed in stunned suspension, episodes on hot asphalt waiting in the dazzling absence of apology. I need this kid to stay mighty and cultish thundering alongside other black kids, their wrestle and whoop, the brightness of it. I need for the world to bear it. And until it will, may the trees kneel closer while we sit in mineral hush together. May the boy whose dark eyes echo my father's dark eyes and his father's dark eyes reach with cupped hands into the braided current, the boy restless and lanky, the boy for whom each moment endlessly opens, for the attention he invests in the beetle's lacquered armor, each furrowed seed or heartbeat, the boy 
who once told me, the world gives you second chances. The boy tugging my arm, saying, look, saying, now. I'm gonna read some poems from this book, If One of Us Should Fall. And uh, this, a lot of these poems are about travel between here and there, um, but also about kind of my experience traveling in a band and recognizing at each place, just the, the richness of the history of the geography of this country and my relationship to it um, at each juncture. Elements. There must be a train station never arrived at smoky boxcar teak and rum, a dark Jamaican who won't say a lot, eyes, small dimes behind frames, furniture heavy, but attentive to a woman speaking in oboes, clay Florida moons under her nails. Think agreement, bouquets beneath polyester, and somewhere between Rochester and Milwaukee, eyes latch and hold, possibly baseball cards, a pint of hot dam, or cardboard towns scraping dark landscapes by. Think someone nearly gorgeous, a name without a saint, loyal to the Mets, an optimist. Ways we fall asleep, hands entwined, crook to crook, rocking. Some dreams, they don't arrive on the backs of tossing ponies. But for now, everything is beginning. The boxcar in muscular silk against closed eyes, his sleepy way of guessing the number of miles by the dust in her hair. This poem is called Vertical Hold. When I read this poem to, to young people, they don't know what vertical hold is because they don't have that reference of the television set. We all know that. Vertical hold, fall, radio silent, into the traffic of variables working themselves around the fact of your head. After surgery, he does not want to come back. Everybody says, go there, says, sorry. You damn well know your grandfather's bedside awaits. His brogan stalled on the back stairs, his margins overrun with handwriting. Their mouths stitch themselves around the question, when? You are on the way. Your body crackling with the static of Pennsylvania electrical storms. Cows pin down the acreage with indifferent hooves, and your car is overrun with guitars, with sad boy voices, sad leather boys, with hair drizzled down their backs, boys pretty enough to sing loose the rusty irons through the waxen wrists of Jesus statues. Harmonies loop and reel against bait shacks and strip malls until Delaware falls away, a three-syllable scab lost to weather, until Virginia's slow farmhouses curtsy and go, until you stop for coffee and push the tractor trailers around the plate with your fork. Keep your blood threaded with sugar and taillights blooming down the coastline until you can fall without considering the mechanics of impact fall in the angle his cursive leans, fall as if darkness can be pulled back in sheaves and dropped into a distance whittled by careful instruments and determination, a thing to be held in both hands, fall until you land needle clean, until you are streamlined, the dark name carved into the tree of his heart. You know, Alice said that Major read last week, and um, and I'm I'm going to read this poem because Major Jackson early on looked at my manuscript, and um, and one of the things he told me is he said, you have too many like random yous in, in these poems. Who is this you? And I I thought about it. I thought it was, it was a good question. It was a fair fair question. And so this poem is is the you in this poem. The you in this poem doesn't have to try hard to be the one raw with trumpets and lightning broken across a crowded room, something we are all brighter and suddenly foreign for, as if we'd forgotten the archipelago of our bodies or the salt in all directions calling out our name. The you in this poem doesn't so much speak 
as stir a darkness of loosened feathers, claws and tendrilled weather upon our eyes and open mouths. No telling why the music carries or what might pry the ribs open. I'm not sure which equation might rescue you from your own skin. I'm saying, I like sky when you speak it. I'll never care which latitude. Even if you leave your body by the roadside for the crickets, I recognize the spine, bowed as Herodotus beneath its story, the sore knees, the bruised and perfect mouth. I know just how to find you, no matter what the distance. I'll hear the pastures singing back our voices, a blade of grass for every tongue. And I have just two more, two more poems to read. This is called, It's All True. Let's say I'm saying, when I love you, I am admiring the fingerprints of every hand that touched you. Time is radiant, vectored in all directions, and the larger issue is little regard for straight lines. Breath coming into this idea deeper than ice age, pushes against the same molecules. Even my saying it alters the speed light takes to reach your retina, reverses and reverses again my dimensions before you. It is dynamic, this now. We touch and touch and touch. This being again my voice speaking into the cool green where fog sets its soft weight. My voice again asking the switchbacks, which syllable is not daylight? Which syllable is sleep? And lastly, um, this, this poem is called Woman, I Am Falling. And this is, um, this is a poem that considers Frank Lloyd Wright, um, who apparently was told and told and told that the, the constructions, the, the houses that he wanted to build were impossible. And, um, and he built them anyway. And I love that as an idea. He's not the only one, but just, just a good example. And those houses, of course, are, you know, beautiful, but, but faulted, you know, faulty, um, faulty monuments. Woman, I am falling, water, a house designed by genius, the genius ignoring the slide rules and proportions of his colleagues, who in turn ignored their pin curled wives, wives with missing silk hose and seam lines penciled up their slender calves. It was depression is, after all, woman. There was a certain attachment to gravity that required disruption, I promise. We needed something impossible to believe in, an equal and opposite Cerberus hound. In this moment of empires with slit bellies beached amongst the shambled mulings of other fallen empires, woman, we needed the whole of it, jettisoned, had to, baby and bathwater both. What a terrible thing to become accustomed to this casserole of lukewarm equations, which is to say, I was dire with circumstance. And since hunger nicely puts all that aside, the agency of certain particulars, for example, I bedeviled my calculations, got them soused and barefoot on the avenue of Americas. I collected the best scrap, lipstick smiles abandoned on champagne flutes, the sweat of bodies drunk with the proximal stillness every city folds into, the smallest possible hours. I promise, with every organic impulse twinkling in the rinds of much better conversation, woman, I am falling water. I am summoned into angle and clean lines worth saying. It is always worth saying in every crucial time, in all signatures, through microphones and lacquered bells. Dear, lasting is not everything. Look at the pieces I break myself into. How otherwise to articulate this feeling, I am trying to show you, onward, with great velocity, we beasts carrying our beast hearts within us to the edges of the world. I am saying how we want with everything to go. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Our next speaker is Gail Mazur. She is the founding director of Blacksmith House Poetry Series and the author of six previous books of poems, including They Can't Take That Away From Me, a finalist for the National Book Award. She has won fellowships from the National Endowment 
of, for the Arts and the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, as well as the St. Botoff Club, Club Foundation Distinguished Artist Award. Her latest book, Land's End, New and Selected Poems, was published in 2020. Please welcome to the screen, Gail Mazur. Let me find you here, Gail. Thank you. What a beautiful reading. What a beautiful reading. Um, I'm so happy to be reading with Nicole and Lloyd and to finally meet you, Alice. I am I'm going to read mostly um, from my book. I have one one new poem that Lloyd encouraged me to, to put in. So the first poem is a translation, actually, of um, a, probably a very famous poem by Michelangelo. I was so vain, I kept the lights low. Now I can't see the page numbers. Um, so this is Michelangelo, who, who was a very prolific poet, as well as a great artist, and his poems are very famous and loved and have been translated and retranslated um, over the centuries. When on my first trip to, to Florence, I had brought with me a Dover book of tra translations of Italian poets, and they weren't very good translations, but it had um, the Italian too. And I I talked to my husband who was fluent in it and said, I wanted to do this and could could I use him, his knowledge? Of, and so he was, he was sort of helpful, but probably the big help was that he took me there and that he introduced me to all these artists. So this is called, this is called To Giovanni da Pistoia, when the author was painting the vault of the Sistine Chapel, 1509. And, it's a great poem about um, how, you know, how we can think that we're doing something awful when we might be doing something really beautiful. I've already grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up here like a cat in Lombardy or anywhere else with the stagnant waters poison. My stomach squashed under my chin, my head's pointing at heaven. My brain's crushed in a casket. My breast twists like a harpies. My brush above me all the time dribbles paint so my face makes a fine floor for droppings. My haunchings are grinding into my, grinding into my guts. My poor ass strains to work as a counterweight. Every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I'm bent taut as a Syrian bow. Because I'm stuck like this, my thoughts are crazy, perfidious tripe. Anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni. Protect my honor. I am not in the right place. I am not a painter. I, I always find that very both sort of moving and encouraging the, the incredible self-doubt that goes along with the creative process. But when, it, when it's somebody like, like Michelangelo, where did I put my... Oh, here. Somebody like Michelangelo, um, you see the absurdity of your own um, self-flagellation while you're working. So the first poem I'm going to um, read is called Mount Fuji, and it is addressed to my husband, Michael. And I need more light. Mount Fuji, I think I lost it. Mm. 
Mount Fuji, Hokusai and Hiroshige, my first presents to you, the two linen-bound books that close with looped ribbons and faux ivory clasps. Decades later, we gaped at Fuji from a window of Japan air and gasped together in Narita, a park so immaculate, white rocks gleamed graphic in a river of gravel. Later still, you'd move between the floating worlds of ukiyo-e woodcuts and Chinese landscapes whose surfaces entered you as if it had been faded. A draftsman's draftman, Hokusai at 70 thought he'd begun to grasp the structure of birds and beasts, insects and fish, of the way plants grow, hoped that by 90 he'd have penetrated to their essential nature, and more by 100, I will have reached the stage where every dot, every mark I make will be alive. You always love that resolve, you repeat joyfully, Hokusai's utterance of faith in work's possibilities, its reward that at 150, he'd perhaps have learned to draw. In Edo then, his beloved Fuji was seen as the true source of immortality, as for him it was to be. Will you always give me such spectacular gifts, you asked me that day, that day when we were 20? And about a 20th century artist who was a, a friend of, my, of Michael's and who um, whose work is in a very exciting show at the Museum of Fine Arts now, um, Philip Guston. They were they were meeting after Guston's class to go to lunch. Philip Guston, everything he said has a form. Even doubt has a form. He said, walking away from class, the painting students all puzzlement at their easels, left there with a week to wonder. Class over, but he still teaching. On Calm Ave, a blue park truck with bright red lettering. Look at that, he said. Look at that. The next poem I'm going to read is called Figures in a Landscape. Figures in a Landscape, and it's dated March 2009. That was the year that my husband died. We were two figures in a landscape in the middle distance in summer. In the foreground, twisty olive trees, a mild wind made the little dry leaves tremble. Then, of course, the horizon, the radiant blue sky. The maker was hungry for light, light silvered the leaves, a stream. I like to think for your sake, the scene was Italian, 17th century. Viewed from here, we resembled one another, though in truth, we were unalike. And we were tiny. He'd kept us small so the painting would be landscape, not anecdote. We were made things, deftly assembled, but beginning to show wear. You, muscular, sculptural. And I was I. We were different. We had a story. On good days, we found comedy in that, pratfalls, and also great sadness. Sun moved across the sky and lowered until you and I were in shadow bereft. The Renaissance had ended. We long known we were mortal. In shadow, I held the wild daisies and cosmos we'd been gathering for the table. Then the sky behind us pinked and inflamed the landscape where we were left to our own reinvention. Two silhouettes who still had places they meant to travel who were not abstractions. Had you pricked them, they'd have bled 
alizarin crimson. I wanted to walk by myself a while, but I'd always been afraid to lose you, and the naked olive groves were hovering as if to surround you. That was the problem. I craved loneliness. I needed the warmth of love. If no one looks at us, do we or don't we disappear? The landscape would survive without us. When you're in it, it's not landscaped any more than the horizons aligned you can stand on. Three trees. August afternoon, rag paper, Windsor Newton charcoal, blackened kneaded eraser beside you in the grass, three bare oak trees. You loved what you called the spikiness of forms, agreed with Rodin that nothing in nature is ugly. Monumental, burnt, those trees expressive for you as close as if your charcoal had been made of them. You love the shushurs of brush on canvas, the shh, shh that our charcoal made on paper. You even loved ekphrastic poems. I hated them. You'd love me writing this. That day I asked, was it the only time I asked what you've been thinking while you drew? And you looked at me blankly. You'd already explained so much to me. That day I wanted to know more, to be inside you, inside your working mind. What, what? How you answered, tree, tree, tree. And the last poem I'm gonna read is Hermit. In ancient Greece, a man could withdraw into the desert to praise his gods in solitude. He'd live out his days by himself in a cave of sand. Eremos, Greek for desert. You could look it up. Hermit crabs live mostly alone in their self-chosen hermitages. They learn young to muscle their soft asymmetrical bodies into abandoned mollusk shells. Without shells, those inadequate bodies wouldn't have survived the centuries. So they tuck their abdomens and weak back legs inside the burden they'll carry on their back. It was Aristotle who first observed they could move from one shell to another. But sometimes a hermit crab is social. Sometimes a sandworm, a ragworm, will live with it inside a snail shell. And sometimes when the crab outgrows its shell, it will remove its odd companion and bring it along to a new larger cell. The Greeks who taught the Western world what could be achieved by living together was also the first in that world to work out a philosophical justification for living alone. If the home it chooses isn't vacant, it will use its large pincer club to extract the old inhabitant, usually a dead or dying or Lord less aggressive hermit crab. Then it spins its spiral shell, its adopted history, sideways, scrabbling across the wet sand. That's where you see them when the tide is out on the flats. At high tide, the weight of the shell is lessened by the upward pressure of water so he can forage for plankton, algae, sea morsels on the ocean floor. Actually, he neither chooses nor inhabits the mollusk shell. He has no choice but to live in it, to lug it with him everywhere until it's his time to move again. No shell he inhabits will be his home forever. Restless, driven, Darwinian, where he lives today might not please or fit him tomorrow. I could tell you more. The flats are seething with unlikely creatures and remnants of life where life's been unfastened. According to Tarot, the hermit has internalized love's lesson to the point where he is the lesson. And you, Gail, though you seem almost frozen, are you sure you won't abandon the crowded, 
calcified armor of your story, of what was given, what freely chosen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Our next speaker is Lloyd Schwartz. Lloyd Schwartz is the Frederick S. Troy Professor of English Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the longtime classical music critic for NPR's Fresh Air, scholar and editor of the works of Elizabeth Bishop, and the current Poet Laureate of Somerville, Massachusetts. Among his awards are NEA and Guggenheim Foundation fellowships for his poetry and a Pulitzer Prize for criticism. His poems have been selected for the Pushcart Prize, the Best American Poetry, and the Best of the Best American Poetry. His most recent poetry collections are Little Kisses and Who's on First New and Selected Poems, published in 2021. Please welcome to the screen, Lloyd Schwartz. Fun to hear, Lloyd. There you are. Thank you. Alice and Bird's books, and um, uh, my breath is taken away by uh, those um, incredible um, readings. Uh, what absolutely extraordinary poems um, both Nicole and, and Gail just read. Um, uh, I, I, I'm so grateful for poetry. <laughs> and so grateful for wonderful poetry um ah um now i have to read some uh, i'm gonna read three poems and um uh my the first poem is uh translation uh this is um uh of a ukrainian poet um i wanted to do something to keep Ukraine in our minds. Um, um, uh, I don't know Ukrainian. And uh, this is a sort of, um, it's a version of a literal translation. So that's how I, that's how it came to be. Uh, the poet is Victor Neborak. And the poem is called fish. Cold-blooded things, living out their days in our bathtub, their long, slippery bodies end in see-through tails, their eyes bulge, just as someday they'll bulge out from their chopped-off heads. They live on oxygen in the water, separated from my room by one thin wall, by another from the mist, dry leaves, street, buildings, cars I live with. Water and food, crucial, but light from either sun or socket may not be so crucial. Water and food, crucial, but knowing someday they're all going to die may not be crucial, unaware as they are of their family connections to other long, slippery bodies. On it goes, bodies quivering on the floor, sharp blows flattening their brains, their insides scooped out and dumped with their scales into the garbage. Then they're poached or fried, their heads dropped into the soup. No fish is an island. This involves all of us, all of us, processing plants drip with their cold blood. Some of us object in poems, paintings, documentary films, Still, they make good eating, even while the fish spirits are watching. Um, 
The next poem is um, for me, it's one of my saddest poems. It's called um, To My Oldest Friend Whose Silence Is Like a Death. In today's paper, a story about our high school drama teacher evicted from his Carnegie Hall rooftop apartment made me ache to call you, the only person I know who'd still remember his talent, his good looks, his self-absorption. We'd laugh at what haven't we laughed, then not laugh, wondering what became of him. But I can't call because I don't know what became of you. After 60 years with no explanation, you're suddenly not there, gone, phone disconnected. I was afraid you might be dead, but you're not dead. You've left, your landlord says. He has your new unlisted number, but insists on respecting your privacy. I located your oldest son, who refuses to tell me anything except that you're alive and not ill. Your ex-wife ignores my letters. What happened? Are you in trouble? Something you've done? Something I've done? We used to tell each other everything. Our automatic reference points to childhood pranks, secret codes, and sexual experiments. How many decades since we started singing each other happy birthday every birthday? Your last uninhibited rendition is still on my voicemail. How often have we exchanged our mutual gratitude, the easy, unthinking kindnesses of long friendship, this mysterious silence isn't kind. It keeps me up at night, bewildered at some stage of grief. Would your actual death be easier to bear? I crave your laugh, your quirky takes, your latest comedy of errors. When one's friends hate each other, Pound wrote near the end of his life, how can there be peace in the world? We loved each other. Why, why, why am I dead to you? Our birthdays are looming. The older I get, the less and less I understand of this world and the people in it. And I'm going to end with a poem about my mother. Little Kisses. My mother is mad at the sun. She hates the daylight. One more new day. In a nursing home, stuck in a wheelchair, she thinks she's been abandoned. In the background, a woman's non-stop wail. My mother can barely hear me on the phone. She doesn't know she's speaking to her son. Oh, then I'm not alone. I have a son. Please, don't forget that. How could I forget that? And you, who are you? Are we related? Of course. Are you my father? Don't you remember your father? Are you my brother? You're my mother. 
I'm your mother? Of course. Was I a good mother? You were. You are a wonderful mother. I'm glad you're my son. What's your name? You don't remember? I can't think of it. I'm all mixed up. Are we related? You're my mother. Did I ask you that before? Yes. Are you angry? Why should I be angry? Because I'm so stupid. What lovely flowers, the nurse says. Did your son bring them? Who? Your son. Isn't this your son? He's my friend. I can't stop myself. Where is your son? Where's my son? What do you mean? Where is your son now? He's dead. Mrs. Schwartz, your son is on the phone. My son? Yes, say hello. Hello. Hello, how are you feeling? Much better, thank you. Why did you call? I call you every day. Forgive me, darling. I didn't remember. Well, hello. How did you know I was here? This is my son. Isn't that right? You're my son, aren't you? You came out of my body. I'm your mother. Isn't that right? Isn't he handsome, even if he has a beard? I'm your mother. I'd love you no matter what you looked like, wouldn't I? Give me a little kiss, will ya, huh? What are you gonna miss, will ya, huh? Gosh, oh gee, why do you refuse? I can't see what you're gonna lose. So give me a little kiss, will ya, huh? And I'll give it right back to you. See? I know all the words. I probably won't remember them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Gail. Hi. Uh, those were spectacular readings. I, I was just, you know, it's the, the hard thing about reading last in a in a reading is that you're kind of worried about what you're going to read and you're not paying attention to what the people are reading who are coming before you. I was just absolutely riveted. Me too. Uh, I I love those all of those poems. Nicole, I was I was almost going to ask you to read that the poem about your son because I love it so much and so i thought oh well she has her own reading scheduled and then you was it was the first thing you read so i was so i was so glad thank you and, i feel i feel a little devastated by your reading um gail oh. i love your reading too those are just exquisite poems that i just i lost myself in but with lloyd i feel i feel rent i feel like those were those were heartbreaking beautiful poems Oh well, thank you. Um, they're, not, they're not. They're not the cheeriest ones. Um, Neither am I. Yeah. yeah all, all of us were harmonizing around. You know, yeah. some loss. <laughs> this, this is the moment. You know, this makes a lot of sense. Um, Nicole, I just think of the first time I saw you with your little boy on at the little pizza place across from the blacksmith house. That's right. That's right. With, with Andrea, right? Yeah. That's great. So I, I, it, I felt like I could really see the whole thing when you read that poem. That was really sweet. It was lovely. It was lovely. Thank you. Gail, I, I, that Michelangelo translation is, is, is really sensational. And 
Nicole, have you have you done any translating uh, yourself? I have not, and I'm thinking so much about translation right now because we're editing a guest, you know, edited translation volume coming oh. for next year, and so I've been thinking just the work of translation and also just how to honor um, because it's it really is a, a, an entirely different creation that stands alongside the original. I would love to hear both of you talk about the act of translating. Yeah. It's so interesting. I, I, I really think it's a kind of moral act uh, I, I, in the world we live in. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's a kind of, it's a real connection with, you know, people, poets and cultures outside of our, our, of our own sphere. Um, and in, in so many other cultures over the centuries, those yeah. poets have been really writing about the situation beautiful poems like Michelangelo did actually, but you know, yeah. during all these horrible wars. And yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think um, um, translating from a language you don't know is a very different experience from translating from a language you you do know because at least if 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 you know the language or you know have some knowledge of the language you can really sense you know some some kind of connection um i just translated a couple of poems from the bengali uh so i can't you know even the, the 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 script itself is unreadable to me, mm -hmm. so I depend on on an on an English version in order to to sort of make something out of it. So the the English version becomes sort of becomes your draft, mm -hmm. and then and then you kind of you're you're kind of you know making your your own poem out of it. So. But it's it's a very interesting process, and it's a great help if you if you if you're blocked writing your own poems. Yeah, yeah, and it's also sometimes I think when you have to work from a trans from a bad translation, you you sort of it, there's a lot of satisfaction in making a better poem out of it than the last translator did. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I mean, it may the at least that's a different that's a challenge that you can, you know how how you're handling the challenge of translating from English to English. Yeah. Well, boy, did you. Then you can try to read aloud the, which which isn't so easy when you don't understand the. Um, but boy, boy, did you succeed, and. Um, um, uh, I mean, I've seen some of those earlier, some of those 19th century translations yeah. of that poem, and they're just deadly. I know. It was amazing not to find a good one. And I, yeah. I'm really, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm bragging I'm happy that I did a good job, you know, and it was really, it, I sort of felt like I broke through for that. But, yeah. but I said, Nicole with my little Dover book there, you know. Yeah, it's such a gift too, Gail, to make that work accessible and have a whole you know, different population have an experience with it and a relationship with it. It's, it's a good bridge to build. And in some cases, the English language reading reader will even just be getting information that they wouldn't have gotten, you know, at the very least. Nicole, um, are, are, oh, I'm sorry. No, if it's readable, that's if it's readable, that's good. I was I wanted to ask Nicole whether being an, an editor has in, interfered with her own writing, or in, or does it encourage you uh, to to write more, or do you have time? Yeah, it is really busy, and I, I feel like you know the pandemic interfered with writing because then everything was collapsed into the space of the house, and um, 
my office is mm-hmm. everything, um, teaching and you know all of the things. Um, but I would say I feel super lucky to be able to read as broadly and widely as I do right now. Last last um, the last time our submission portal was open, we got twelve thousand submissions. And so, you know, you just, you know, there's a certain way that you're just like, you're just reading sort of endlessly. And so I feel like I really do, like, it's a privilege to be able to hear that many voices and to hear what people are thinking about and what people are actually living and experiencing. Um, so I, I find that really inspiring. And it's not so much, it's, you know, you, you're reading in a kind of clinical way, too. It's it's not just what I like and what my tastes are. It's kind of how how each each text is operating and if it's succeeding on its own terms. And um, so no, I, I feel super, I feel, you know, like full certainly, but um, but I do find it, it gives me a lot of energy to read that broadly and and under the gun, you know, because I'm, <laughs> like I'm, I'm trying to get back to everyone within six months. So I appreciate it. I think oh, <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. I was, I was gonna, tell you both I, well both gail and i have a um an elsa dorfman photograph of robert lowell um, <laughs> mine show i think yours isn't showing right now it was it was a, a little while ago and one of the one of the there it is it's a a photograph of lowell in silhouette and it's so characteristic it's just and 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 there's the <laughs> one behind me but why i mention lowell is that one of the nicest presents i ever got and what really one of my most cherished presents um was actually uh was from frank bedart and it was the present that he gave me when i passed my phd orals and it was the first volume the first issue of the kenyan review which really? was which had two palms in it by robert lowell two very i think maybe even his first published palms and mm-hmm. you know, i'm i i love lowell lowell's poetry and i loved him i i know gail did too does and does too and that issue of the Kenyan Review is just so precious to me, and so I have, I have very, very, very warm feelings uh, uh, about the about the Kenyan Review. Um, yeah, the Kenyan Review has been around since 1939, and the backlist is isn't is that, wild. It's wild. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, 39. Yeah. It was a wow. pause, but yeah, it's really, you know, it's it's a it's a treat to be able to be associated with that publication. Look at these pictures with all the books. <laughs> <laughs> the bookstore. 1939 is the year Wizard of Oz came out and Gone with the Wind. Yeah, right. It's quite a year in, in that we you know, that was quite a year of, of creativity, evidently. Yeah, I've got a lot of books behind me. I like having a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for all of your readings. I do have a question in the Ask a Question tab that I would like to. Uh, it is that I would like to ask of you. Nell Painter asks, "What makes translations of poetry bad?" I know the easy answers to this question, but what are some of the deeper ones? <laughs> I, it's well, not I, homework. Just do your best. You know. Well, you know, I think the bad translations, you know, are are they? They're in a lang. See, they're kind of in a language that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. That um, well, you know that 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 the 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 um comfort of the original poet with his or her own poems is 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 there in the original language and the bad translations um 
are in a way they're so desperate to be accurate that the language itself isn't English and it isn't Italian or Ukrainian. Uh, it, it, it's, it's some, it's some thing that, that just doesn't breathe. Um, I don't know. That's my answer. But the, but the joy in feeling like you've gotten it when you do a translation, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's at least as wonderful as feeling good about a poem of your own that you just finished, you yeah. know, but, but yeah. it, it's something else because you're also feeling that not that you're recovering it because the poem exists in language, but but that you're sort of you're offering something to um, to, to the reader that, that that you believe is 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 a good translation, or you wouldn't offer it being you and me. <laughs> Nicole, this the tr this translation issue of of Kenyan. Um, um, the, were, were those the poems chosen by by guest editors, or were they, they solic yeah. or solicited by guest at by the guest editors? We had an open call, and and the guest editors chose them and 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 put together a folio that they're excited about. So it's Jenny Croft and Anton Herr and um, Jeremy Tang. And, and they're all like, they're so, they're really kind and, and working just, you know, broadly and, and they're right now, all of them are, are having a moment, you know, <laughs> of enormous success, but they took time aside to, to read through these translations. And really part of their ambition is to, to, to do the thing that Gail, that you were just talking about, to, to elevate the work, you know, not just to offer a version that's a, a serviceable version, an accurate version. I think yeah. I think um, right. Lloyd, you, you use yeah. that word, but to do something that is actually um, undescribable and has a new kind of life and energy and uh, crackle to it. So they want some yeah. rowdy stuff, and they've they've assembled some work that is very rowdy. I it, it oh, is good. a fun though for for the translator that you're often move to translate because you've read a bad translation so you you have some idea of the content of the poem so you you're you may not be rescuing it if you do the translating it but you know but you also do feel like you're rescuing it in a way you get sort of very paternal about it maternal paternal right <laughs> <Pratt> conceited um, <laughs> you know there's a collection by Robert Lowell called Imitations, which is very controversial because he, it's a book of, you know, in quotes, translations, but they're really, in a way, they're Lowell's versions of whatever it was that inspired the original poets. Also, in some of, some of them in languages that he knew, French, Italian and but there were some poems in Russian that that he and that Lowell didn't know and he really kind of recreates what he is getting from the original poems uh I think they're wonderful he he dedicated the book to Elizabeth Bishop and, and Elizabeth Bishop was a much more was much more um worried about accuracy and i mean she did wonderful her translations her own translations are wonderful but they're they're also from a language that she knew and what were her, what were her three values oh uh her three values were um i should th th this is something accuracy spontaneity and mystery Ooh. That's great. Isn't that great? That don't is you, great. Don't you wish accuracy everybody and wrote, Don't you wish everybody wrote poems that were accurate, spontaneous, and mysterious? Mysterious, yes. Uh, boy, you you two certainly do. 
Well, folks, we're coming to the end of the hour, and I'm going to oh. ask a couple of. I know I, it's such a sad thing. I never, <laughs> I never like to end these hours, but I am going to ask a couple of questions, um, just because I think people would like to know uh, what advice would you give to someone who was writing their first book? Just quick advice. Don't rush. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, show what you've written to someone you trust. Hmm. Get some, get some feedback. I think finding an order is one of the hardest things about putting a book together. And the first time you do it, it's really scary. And I think what you said about find someone you trust, I mean, if it's the first time you put a book together, friends who think about these things are invaluable. That's true. Yeah. And I would also say um, it's important to honor kind of the impulse of the poem itself. You know, I think a lot of times we can get in there and, and over, you know, overdo and edit and, and aim for perfection, where I, I think some of our work is to, to listen and to be available and let the poem or the text tell you what it, it needs to be. On our honor that and to focus on honoring yeah. that seems important. Yeah. Folks, I always ask one last question. What are you reading now? And I think Lloyd, I know what your answer is because it, unless, unless you're not reading it anymore because you answered it a couple of weeks ago. Well, I, I, I am, I am, I actually am better prepared this time. <laughs> um, um, you know, the, 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 the composer Elliot Carter uh, wrote a song cycle based on six poems by Elizabeth Bishop. So by some weird coincidence, I am reading a yet another new book on Elizabeth Bishop. There have been oh, two wow. great biographies. And this, this one by Jonathan Post is, uh, it's an Oxford, little tiny Oxford mm. book called Elizabeth Bishop, a very short introduction. And uh, I'm reading it with great pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I, I know a lot about Elizabeth Bishop, um, but it's, uh, this is a, it's a very thoughtful and well-written book. And I am also dipping into this tome that's published by Cambridge uh, by John Link called Elliot Carter's Late Music. And it's really one of the best, I mean, it sounds like it's gonna be, you know, in you know really hard to read but in fact uh it's very readable and uh i've really been enjoying it and uh wish i had more time to just sit and read but uh <laughs> i know the for feeling in, for yeah for dipping <laughs> into I, I i've really uh enjoyed both of these books and it's nice that they sort of came out at, at the same time what, what ladies what are you reading um, one of my plans is to read this book that's been in my husband's bookshelf and that I used to read in but never read, which is the letters of Lucien of, of Pizarro to his son Lucien, who was also an artist. And he, there was a sentence that, that it was all translated that I never forgot that made me say, I have to go back and read these. He writes to his son Lucien, let us work hard and make dazzling grays. G-R-E-Y-S. And I'm, I'm reading, I don't, I also feel like I wish I had more time to, to read. And so I just drag the books around the house wherever I am. So this is a book that I'm reading right now that I love and love. Can you and back it up just, a little so I can see the title? Back yeah. away, there you go. Yeah, oh, I, sure. I haven't yeah. read it yet. Oh. Yeah, Kenny oh, wow. loves this book. And then also John Keane's Punks. Um, Who's that, John? Who? It's Keen. John Keane. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which you know, this is his stomping ground is our stomping ground, so it's a very familiar kind of. What's the name of John Keane's book? Punks: New and Selected Poems. Okay. I'm loving well, these books. I do. I just carry them around well. everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Well, folks, this has been a wonderful hour. I really want to thank each of, each of you for being here. And I am going to let you go so that I can say goodbye to the people attending. 
I'd like to thank Gail, Lloyd, and Nicole for participating in Right America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you particularly to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Right America. We hope to see you at our next episode, Monday, June 27th, at 7, as usual. And we welcome Rachel Paston, Allison Fairbrother, and Ty Jess. Please remember to check out Bird's Books of Right America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thanks, folks, for joining us. <laughs>